going to attempt to record our class meetings, at least some of them. So up here on the top right hand side of the screen, you see that box? If that light is blinking, that means that I'm recording. Um, and I'm not recording video, just audio. So if you ask questions, there's a chance the microphone might pick it up too. Um, it usually picks me up pretty well. Right. Um, and the reason I do that is in case you miss a class or in case you forget something that happened, you can go back and view the recording um, through Angel. It's posted to YouTube, but I post a link in it, a link in Angel to the YouTube video. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it will record audio and it will record whatever I do on my screen. If you notice this box is up, but it's not blinking, and you think I should be recording, let me know. Because sometimes I just forget to click it. All right, even though this class meets twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 12 o'clock to 1.15, is that correct? Even though we meet twice a week, there's still an ANGEL component to the class. Um, a lot of the assignments will be submitted through ANGEL. A lot of the materials for the class will be posted in ANGEL. So I'm going to walk you through class looks like in Angel. Raise your hand if you're not familiar with Angel. Okay. Have you used Angel before? Yes, sir. Okay. So the first time you sign in, the information is right here for you. It's 34 underscore plus your student number. The password should be the same. Mine looks a little bit different. We're going to call this the course homepage. Actually, this is the angel homepage. This will list all the courses you're taking that have an angel component. Once you click on the right course, and this one is 20372, it should bring you here, and this is what we're going to call the course homepage. All right, from the course homepage, you'll see your mail feature. This is the primary mode of communication for this class. Primary, first, first option. If you want to get a hold of me, if you want to send me something or ask me a question, this is the best way to do it. Um, and I'll walk you, how, walk you through how to do that. If you click on View Inbox, <coughs> and then Compose Message, if you click the To button, you'll get a directory. You can see everyone that's in the class, including me. If you wanted to send an email to the whole class, you could do that. You would just click All Course Students. You're not done yet, though. You can't click OK. What do you have to do first? You have to send it into this little To field. If you don't do that, the message will not send. Okay. So if you wanted to send a message to all students in the class, you can do that. If you want to send it to me, I'm Palmer, and I should be here somewhere, make sure to put it in that two box. Then click OK. Your recipients will appear in that two box up there. Type subject, type your email, and send, just like sending email. Um, this is the primary mode of communication. This is what I would prefer because I get to sort all my emails by class so I know where it's coming from. All right. Any questions about that? If you email me through Angel between Sunday and Thursday, you should probably expect a response within about 24 hours. Sometimes you'll get a response within like five seconds if I'm sitting at my desk and I happen to see it. Um, but give me up to 24 hours to get back to you. If you have an emergency or if you need a response sooner, I would say first try Angel, but if I don't get back to you, you can send an email to my linear tech email. You might get a response faster that way. And that's on the syllabus, which I'll show you in a second. Or you can call my office number anytime. Um, I'm only here Monday through Thursday. But you can call the office number. And those are your only options. But those are secondary and tertiary options for contacting me. All right, back to the course homepage. So that's the mail feature. You also have a course syllabus here, which I'll open up and show you. I don't give you printed copies of the syllabus because you can access it through Angel. So if you want to print one, you can. You can probably do it from the library or something. If you want one for your, your records or just like to have a printed copy. But this is it. I think the information on here is pretty accurate. If you see something that looks like it needs to be updated or changed, let me know. Um, but this is our course CRN number. That's a course registration number. Every course has a different number. Like even if you have two, two English 1101 classes, they have to have some kind of number to distinguish them from each other. So that's our course CRN number. Fall 2015 is the right term. It's face-to-face -face class, means twice a week. Tuesday, Thursday, 12 to 15, that's correct. Oakwood, classroom 305, that all looks right to me. 
prerequisite, you must have a certain score on the compass exam, <coughs> or you must have passed English 90, or if you took these classes a while ago, English 98 would work too. There's a course description. This is kind of a good place to start. Course description. This is called English 1101. Do I see what that says right there? Composition and rhetoric. Is everybody in the right place? Mm -hmm. Do you want to take this class or are you taking it just because you have to? Because you have to. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, if we took AP English high school, is that still like the same thing? AP language or AP lit? AP language. Yep. So you might be able to just exempt it for your AP, yeah. What was your, did you take the test? Yeah. What did you score on the test? Uh, I'm going to check in. I know what you scored. Okay. Maybe if you scored like a three, a four, or a five, you might be able to exempt it. What's that? I think you, if you took the AP test and you score a three, a four, or a five, you might be able to exempt the whole class. Okay. I'd like to have you around, but no need for you to take classes you don't need to. All right, so it's called composition and rhetoric. Most of you have to take this class, and that's why you're here. Very few people tell me they're taking it just because they want to. I don't think I've, I've had maybe one student say he's taking it because he wanted to take it, not because he had to. Okay, let me rephrase. I've had one student that I don't think was lying told me he was taking it because <laughs> he wanted to. But you are taking it, so do you know what it is? What is composition and rhetoric? Basic English. Basic English? What is composition? What does that mean? Say it again. Components of writing. Components of writing. What's the root word of composition? To compose, what does to compose mean? To write. to write. All right, so that's half of it. Half of the class is writing, right? Composition is the act of writing, the act of composing. What about the other half? That's usually the scary part. Reading. Good guess, but no. <laughs> it's not. It's not reading. Rhetoric is not reading. It's not understanding. Uh, well, it's related to critical thinking, but it's not like critical thinking. Nope. If I had money, I would offer money to the first person that could tell me what rhetoric is. Yeah. I will give a pen, a United Community Bank pen, to the first person that could tell me what rhetoric is. Do I have questions? Y'all are just guessing. Yeah. Use your resources. <laughs> Y'all have more, you know that a smartphone has more computing power than the first rocket we sent to space? Okay, gotcha. More computing power than the first rocket ship that we sent into outer Persuasive space. Speaking. In, the, in your pocket. Say it again. Persuasive speaking. Persuasive speaking. Okay, now we're getting toward a definition of rhetoric. <laughs> rhetoric, I'll give you a, a definition. If you're a note taker, I would write this down. If you're not a note taker, you better have a really good memory. Rhetoric is the art of using language persuasively. So you just said persuasive what? Speaking. Persuasive speaking or writing. We're dealing with composition, right? Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with the writing aspect. So we're going to call it the art of using language persuasively. Let me give you a better example, a rhetorical question. Is that a meal? It's the 
sky blue? And someone says, are you hungry? Well, is the sky blue? That's answering with a rhetorical question, right? Yeah. Maybe you're on your way to school and Bobby's speeding down the highway. He's giving you a ride to school. Bobby's going 95 miles an hour down the highway. And you look at Bobby and say, Bobby, are you trying to kill us? Yeah, sure. You already know the answer, right? He's not trying to kill you. He's trying to get to school on time. But when you ask a question like that, you're trying to persuade Bobby that maybe he's making a poor choice and going so fast, right? Mm -hmm. By asking a question that doesn't even need an answer. That's rhetoric, using language artfully to persuade someone. Yeah. So that's how it relates to rhetorical questions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So now you know what rhetoric is. Now you know what composition is. Everybody still want to stay? <laughs> yeah. I underline art because rhetoric and composition, it's an art, it's not a what? If it's an art, then it's not a what? It's not a science, right? Sciences are like biology, chemistry, math. Math is a science. How many correct answers are there to that question? That's one, as far as I know. Right, two plus two equals four, hopefully. So there's one correct answer. Usually with sciences, that's the way things go. Black and white answers, cut and dry. You know, one possibility. Art is different. How many potential ways are there to paint a sunset? A bunch. A million different ways. As many ways as there are people, and maybe more, right? So painting is an art. There's no one correct way to paint a sunset. There's many ways you can do it. Come up with a quote unquote correct answer or correct picture. So language works the same way. That's why it's an art. All right, now we know what the class is. Maybe I'll show you a little bit more around Angel, or maybe I'll walk you through some more of the syllabus. Here are the outcomes. We want you to learn how to analyze writing, practice your writing. We want you to learn how to revise writing, your own and other people's. We want you to learn how to do research and write research papers. We want you to learn how to format your documents correctly, which means it should look a certain way on the page. And we also want you to be able to document the sources that you use when you do research. Document means like give credit to. You know how you watch a movie and at the end of the movie, any song that they played in the movie, they'll have a credit mm -hmm. when the credits roll. They'll say what band did the song, you know, what album it's from, what year it was recorded. That's documentation in a movie. You do the same thing for your essay when you use someone else's words or information or ideas in your essay. Exciting. Documentation and citing are very similar, very similar concepts. I'll teach you the difference this semester. And critical thinking. That's hard. That's a challenge. I can teach you grammar. Teaching critical thinking is, diff is difficult. Teaching people how to think, like, that's a challenge. I'm supposed to be able to do that in 16 weeks? Mm -hmm. Teach you how to think critically? Hopefully, most of you already have some critical thinking skills, but maybe I'll give you some names for those skills you already have, or I'll teach you some critical thinking skills that maybe you don't already have. But that's a challenge. I don't just teach reading. I have to teach critical thinking because if you're going to be able to persuade people using your language, you have to use things like logic, right? Things that make sense. Appealing to logic. This is this this course covers academic writing. This is not a creative writing class. So you're not going to be writing poetry. You're not going to be writing short stories. That's not what this class is about. This class teaches more basic fundamentals of grammar and writing and academic style writing, which <coughs> attempts to persuade people by using critical thinking, which is based on logic and things that make sense. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I hope so. All right, so those are the outcomes. That's what we're striving for. This is the required textbook right here. The Norton Field Guide to Writing. That is our required textbook. It looks like this. If you choose not to buy it from the bookstore for some reason, make sure you get the right one. It has to have readings and handbook. Right here, readings and handbook. It must have the readings and handbook. They sell it without the readings. They sell it without the handbook. They sell it without the readings or the handbook. So make sure you get it with the readings and the handbook. I think the bookstore will rent it or sell used copies at a pretty reasonable price. Are usually competitive, but if you find it online, that's fine too. Just make sure you get the right one. Anybody get the textbook yet? 
How much was it? How much? 97? Here? That's too much. Take it back if you rent it for 97. Should you should get it for less than I rented it online for like 64. 64? That's better. Better than 97. You need to figure out where she went. <laughs> 44, there you go. So anyway, shop around, baby. Yeah, absolutely. the only textbook you need. That's the only one. That's the only requirement. Um, other requirements for the class, though, would be reliable internet access because there is an online portion to the class. So even though it's not an online class, it is required that you have reliable online access. And if you don't have it at home, you can use it here at the school. You can use a public library, wherever you want to. Uh, Starbucks, if you want to. Um, but you need internet access because not, not having internet access will not be an excuse for not submitting documents. You also need Microsoft Word. Microsoft Word is a requirement, not Google Docs, not WordPad. It has to be Microsoft Word. If you submit your documents in Google Docs format, I'm not going to be able to accept it because this plagiarism scanning software that I use will not work with Google Docs. It won't work properly, yes. I think OpenOffice is Microsoft Word. I think. You can use, like, if you change the format to, like, equal to Microsoft Word. But That's fine. If you do that, then you're fine. But your files have to be .doc or .dox files. Google Docs does, like, I think it's .g, .gdoc or something like that. So this is no good. It has to be Microsoft Word format. All right, grading, grading is the same across the college. And here's the grading for the class and the assignments that you're going to be doing. So you'll have quizzes and minor writing assignments that will comprise 10% of your grade. You will have four peer editing assignments, which will comprise 15% of your grade. Major essays, a minimum of two major essays, which comprise 25%, plus a research paper, plus an <coughs> essay exam. So four major essay assignments. Two major essays, a research paper is actually an essay, it's just worth more than the others, and an essay exam. Everybody with me so far? Okay. The essay exam is timed, so prepare for that mentally, I guess. I'll give you a chance to practice writing in a timed environment, too. But by the time we get to the end of the semester, you should be able to do it. Um, I already told you about class communications. Primary mode is Angel. Check your Angel email on a daily basis, every day. You never know when I might send you something important, or another instructor might send you something important. Also, check your Lanier Tech email. Sometimes students don't even realize they have one. You need to you need to use it. And and here's a tip: if you don't want to, if you don't want three or four different emails to manage, you can set up your Lanier Tech email to forward to your personal email. That way, you don't have to log into two different accounts. Set it up to forward your messages to your personal, and you're in good shape. Okay, make sure you do that. Because important information does come through there too. You must have your book by the end of this week. If you choose to withdraw from the class for any reason, please let me know. You need Angel. You need internet connectivity. Your Dropbox submissions must be Word format. You must format your documents according to MLA style, and I'll teach you how to do that, or I'll show you where you can figure out how to do that. If for some reason, this is pretty important, if for some reason you cannot submit an assignment to a Dropbox, maybe you go to submit it to the Dropbox and the Dropbox isn't there. That might be my fault, but either way, it might be your computer's fault. Maybe it doesn't recognize it. If you cannot submit an assignment to an electronic Dropbox, email it to me as an attachment. And here's, here's the catch. Before the deadline, not after the deadline. So if you have 10 minutes left and you go to submit your, your document to the Dropbox and it's not working, you better get an email drafted quickly with an attachment with the correct document on there so that it's time stamped before the deadline. Do we get that? So 
you have a problem, you can email it to me. To it's jpalmer at lanertech.edu. It's on the syllabus. But make sure you do that before the deadline, or else I can't give you full credit. This is a blurb for the timed essay exam that will be at the end of the semester. Attendance policy is 20%. You may not miss more than 20% of class meetings. So we have 15 weeks. We meet twice a week. That's approximately 30 class meetings. So you may not exceed six absences. Six is a lot of classes to miss, though, in a semester. If you miss six absences, the odds of you doing very well in this class are not good. People that miss six, people that miss six classes usually don't do very well. So if you need to miss one or two, that's not a major problem. I'll try to record some of the class meetings as I can so you have access, um, but do not exceed six or you will be dropped from the class. Our no-show policy is there. Y'all are already covered with the no-show policy because you showed up this week. <coughs> Cell phone use, it says it's prohibited, but it's not. It's prohibited for non-academic purposes. You all would have taken out your phone and started looking up rhetoric before I told you you could. You would have been fine, because that's academic purposes. All right, your phone is a tool, it's an instrument. Unless maybe you're doing like an essay exam or something like that, then I might tell you, you know, no electronic devices. Um, but for the most part, if you want to use your phone at any point during class for academic purposes, please, by all means, go ahead. If you have a laptop, you can bring it, a tablet, whatever you need. Um, but as far as personal reasons, if you need to use your cell phone, just excuse yourself from the room. If you excuse yourself from the room 12 times in a class period, I'm not going to say anything. I might get a little bit annoyed, but that's your choice. Okay, if you need to check in on your sick family member a couple times during class, that's fine. You can do that. You're an adult. You can leave the room and do it. But if it's not worth getting up and leaving the room to do, then it's not worth doing in class. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Academic honesty policy. Don't cheat and don't plagiarize. Um, plagiarism is especially important for this class. It defines it here as a dishonest, dishonest act that occurs when the student passes off someone, someone else's work as his or her own. This can happen accidentally when you're incorporating work from other people, like I'm going to instruct you to do. If you do not give that credit to the person, like the movie does at the end with the song titles at the end, if you don't give that credit in the correct way, you could be guilty of plagiarism, even unintentionally. But the penalty for unintentional plagiarism is the same as the penalty for intentional plagiarism, which is a failing grade on the assignment, most likely a zero. And repeat <coughs> offenses, you get removed from the class. Does that make sense? Doesn't seem fair, but that's the way it is. It's like the penalty for speeding intentionally and the penalty for speeding unintentionally, they're the same, right? <coughs> if the cop pulls you over and you're like, but I was speeding by accident get the same ticket as the guy that was speeding on purpose, right? Mm -hmm. At least you should. That's the way it's supposed to be. Oh, recycling work. If you took this class before, you cannot use work from, from the class that you took before, even though it's your own work. If you have a friend that took this class, you cannot use your friend's work. And, and I will catch it because all the essays get run through plagiarism scanning software. So if your friend took an English 11-1 class pretty much at any college in the state of Georgia, we all use the same software, so we would pick up on it. So don't try to do that. Safety and emergency procedures. If for some reason there's some kind of safety hazard or fire drill, just follow my instructions and I'll tell you what to do. There are documents on that bulletin board, the brightly colored documents that tell us what to do. There are exits at the end of both, both ends of the hallway here. So if we have to leave, we'll leave class. If you have some kind of health issue that I need to know about, like an, I don't know, a serious allergy or any, any kind of serious medical issue that you have that I might need to know about, please let me know. You don't have to tell me now. You can tell me after class by email. Um, and that's just so that I don't end up giving you a hind link because your throat's closing up from an allergic reaction, because that's happened before. <laughs> she was okay. She made it. I would sign up for Lanier Alerts if you haven't already. If you go to the school website, you we scroll down to the very bottom here where it says Lanier Alert. I would sign up for that. That way you get text messages to your phone um, if the school closes for some reason. I mean, we're going to go into the early part of December, so I suppose there's a chance we could get icy roads or something like that and class could be canceled. So sign up for that. 
If you have some kind of disability, uh, make sure you contact our disabilities coordinator and she will set you up if you need accommodations. She'll let me know about that. Or you could let me know as well through email or after class. If you need academic support, there are a number of services available. Tutoring hours will be available on campus. The library has hours too. Online students have access to Smart Thinking, but you won't for this class. If you have an, anybody have an online class here other than this, fully online? If you do, if you want to kind of game the system a little bit, you should have access to this feature called Smart Thinking Tutoring. You might have to ask your instructor to add it. But if you do, you can use that service and you can submit essays for this class to a tutor online. They'll look at it, give you some feedback, and send it back to you. So technically, that's not what you're supposed to do. It's only supposed to be for your online class, but usually they don't ask any questions about it. So it's free. Well, it's not free. It comes with the price of tuition. And this is a course calendar. I haven't added dates yet, but I'm going to try to follow this. This is week one. Um, our week is going to start on Monday and end on Monday. So even though we're starting this week on a Tuesday, for the most part, the week starts Monday at noon and ends Monday at noon. And the reason I end it Monday at noon and I have a lot of your due dates set for Monday at noon is because I'm on campus on Monday mornings. So if you had some kind of major issue, you could contact me and let me know. Whereas if I set it for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you're not going to be able to get a hold of me if you have to. You can see here I have some key assignments and due dates. So you know that this assignment here, the 100 word anecdote, that's due this week. Most likely it will be due Monday at noon. Questions? That's the syllabus. Yes? Um, do you know when tutoring those classes? We're working on it right now. We're putting together a schedule. Um, we have a lab down at the end of the hall. It's room 315. Mm -hmm. And when, that, when there are not classes in session in that room, 315, typically we have a tutor there. But we will publicize our tutoring schedule. I have office hours. I think it said Monday, Wednesday. I have office hours, so I can help you out with things Monday, Wednesday, 9 to 11. I prefer that you email me and let me know that you're coming so I can make sure that I'm there. Um, but if you need to, you can drop in during those times. Too. And then Monday, Wednesday, or Monday, Thursday? You're right, Monday, Thursday. Thank you. Monday, Thursday, 9 to 11. If that changes, I'll let you know. Um, but when we get the tutoring schedule publicized, it will appear right there. You see that? In the middle of the screen toward the bottom where it says tutoring. Once we have it publicized, it will be there. I think it will also be available if I go to the Angel homepage, not the course homepage, the Angel homepage. Sometimes they put it in public announcements here. Or actually, they might put it on this login screen where it says Academic Support Services. They usually publish it there too. Campus tutoring schedules. Any other questions? <coughs> no? So back to our Angel course homepage. I showed you the mail. We looked at the syllabus entirely. Not in depth though. That syllabus is a contract. It's a contract between me and you. A contract is an agreement between two parties. You are one party, I'm the other party. So once you agree to that, part of your one of your assignments this week is to sign a, a syllabus agreement that says that you agree to go by whatever the syllabus says, and by me writing the syllabus, I agree to it too. So I'm not going to stray from it one way or the other. Um, that is our agreement. So make sure you take a look at that closely. Most of the information you're going to need in Angel here will appear under this Lessons tab. This is the course homepage, so that's the course tab. I don't really use the calendar. Um, I have dates in the lessons tab for you. So I don't use the calendar. I don't really use the resources tab. I don't use communicate, because you can just use this box here for the mail. You might be able to run a grade report here. You might use that tab once in a while. Um, and I don't think you have access to these other two. So the tab that you're most concerned with is lessons. And this is what it looks like. There are a number of folders in lessons. I organize the class by weeks. So there are 15 weeks in the semester, plus a week for finals. I organize it all by week. If I click on this folder, notice there's only one folder so far. So I open it up every week. There will be an additional folder. I don't delete folders after I put them there. So week one will be there throughout the semester. 
but that is how the class is organized. All right. Also, in lessons, there is a whole folder for your research paper, which you don't have to worry about just yet. We'll go through it together. There's a folder for helpful resources, which includes websites and documents that can help you with your writing or conduct your research. There's a folder for technical issues, so if you're having trouble posting an assignment or uploading an assignment, you might want to check here first before you email me. There's our entire plagiarism policy, which you're responsible for knowing, and a little bit of information about myself. So what we need to worry about this week is the weekly folders and the week one folder. There are a number of items in there. Every week I try to give you a checklist, a checklist of items to do. So it helps you stay organized and it helps me stay organized, honestly. So if I click on that, you'll see what the checklist looks like. That's what you need to do for this week. And I try to give you some time parameters of how long these things might take you. So this first one, well, you're not an online student, so you can ignore that first one. Um, but you do need to attend class and view any potential recordings in the week one folder. So that might take you close to three hours. Because our class meeting time is what? 75 minutes times two, 150 minutes. That's like two and a half hours, right? All right, next, find and read the syllabus. We already did that to some extent, but I would look at all the details of the syllabus before you decide to agree to it. So that might take you about 15 minutes. You already know where to find it, right? <coughs> where can you find the course syllabus? Course homepage. course homepage, very good. Next assignment, electronically sign and submit the syllabus agreement to the Dropbox in the week one folder. It's due by noon on Monday tells you where the syllabus agreement is found. It says in lessons, it's actually in the week one folder in lessons. So let's check to make sure it's there. See that document right there that says syllabus agreement? I'll open that up. It should look something like this. It says you agree to all the terms and conditions, specifically the late work and the attendance policy, and that you must use Microsoft Word. And when I say electronically sign, you just have to type your name. I'm not, I don't care too much about the format. And then the date. Once you've done that, save it wherever you want, to a USB drive or your desktop or anywhere you want to save it. Once you have saved the document, go back to the week one folder. do this in chronological order for you. So you got your checklist. There we go. Checklist, syllabus agreement, there's a Dropbox for the syllabus agreement. So if you open that, please read the instructions. It says, read the syllabus, open it, electronically sign it, then save the document, upload it to the Dropbox as a word attachment. Upload means like grab the file that you saved, upload it to this Dropbox. What some people will do, they will copy and paste and put it in this box. That's not what I'm asking you to do. If I want you to copy and paste something, I'll tell you, copy and paste it. Or I'll tell you, type your response in the text box. But if I say upload, then that means you go down here to the attachments. Actually, let's title it first. I would title your, title your assignment with your last name plus the assignment name. That makes it easy for me to find if I have to. All right, so Palmer syllabus agreement, I've titled it. I don't have to type anything in the text box. I click attachment and I have to find where I saved it. Where do I put it in the desktop? Is that where it was? Upload. Finish. And if you were successful, it will, it will appear right here. And it's a link that would open it up to show you that you were successful. Does that make sense? All right. Move on. Back to the checklist. So we've electronically signed and submitted our document. Then you have to read a document called Advice for Success. It's only maybe a page or two, Microsoft Word, so it should only take about five minutes. There's another one called Problems with English. That's only a couple pages. And then another one that's a couple pages that's four cardinal rules for better academic writing. So these should only take five to 10 minutes to read a piece. Not a whole lot of reading there. 
Next, complete the 100 word anecdote rough draft assignment due by noon on Monday. So it's your first writing assignment. And it says submit that as a Word file attachment to turn it in Dropbox. So if I show you the week one folder again, notice down there at the bottom, that is the Dropbox for the anecdote assignment. Everybody with me so far? I'm going to tell you about what that is and we'll go through the instructions in detail probably on Thursday. But the instructions are also available if you want to read them on your own. They're in the folder right here. And it looks like everything else that I told you about is there. Can you see a quiz on here? There it is. Week one quiz. So after your writing assignment, you want to complete the week one quiz. It covers everything from this week. Everything I've just rambled on about for the last 40 minutes, plus anything that's found in the week one folder. Any of the documents I told you to read. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. right. And buy your textbook. Get that by the end of the week. Questions about the week one checklist. Questions about Angel, how it's organized. I kill him already. <laughs> you all right? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. I teach a 730 class. I'm used to that at 730, not now though. OK, uh, so what do you need to know now? You need to know about basic sentence patterns and punctuation. That's what you need to know. How much time do I have to teach you that right now? 30 minutes? I can get a good start in 30 minutes. So you all are coming from different places. Some of you are coming from right out of high school. Some of you have been out of high school for a while. Some of you took learning support. Some of you didn't. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what your background is and how much English you know, but I know how much you're supposed to know. Unfortunately, how much you're supposed to know doesn't always match up with what you really need to know. Okay? Sometimes people don't know what they're supposed to know yet. So this week is a bit of a re review, or it should be a review for most of you. And I'm not going to review every single thing you've learned, but have you ever noticed that English tends to be repetitive throughout your educational experience? You seem to learn the same things over and over again. Like your 12th grade teacher is teaching you how to use a comma when your 4th grade teacher also taught you how to use a comma, right? I don't know what that what that says. Is that because the students don't learn it or teachers just want to do the same thing over and over again? I don't know. But that's the way it seems to go. Maybe the students just don't, don't retain the knowledge. But you need to retain it now. Okay, I'm going to give you a review in maybe one week. I might do a little review next week, but it has to stick now. If it hasn't stuck since elementary school, now is the time to make it stick. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm going to start with sentences. So I'm skipping some things. I'm skipping parts of speech, right? The sentences are composed of words, and words are made up of different parts of speech, so I'm skipping that. So if you don't know what the parts of speech are, you might want to look that up. You might want to learn about that. Google it. Um, so I'm moving on to sentences. There are actually different types of sentences. Can anybody help me identify what some different types of sentences are? What do you think? Simple, complex, great. All right, let's start with simple. That is one type of sentence. Complex is another. Put that here. What else? Yes. Compound, complex. So what am I missing? Compound. And I guess if I want to get really technical, if I can have a compound complex sentence, what else might I be able to have? Complex, compound. If I'm being technical. All right, so that's not too bad, right? These are sentence, I'm going to call these sentence types. So one, two, three, four, five. Some people would group these two together and just call it four types, but you can call it five if you want to. So those are our sentence types. What distinguishes one from another? What distinguishes a simple sentence from a compound sentence? Say it again. Type of verbs and subjects? Close. Try again. 
not type the amount, the number of subjects and verbs that we have. The number. So, sentences are comprised of something. They're made up of what? To create these sentences in these different types, you have to have subjects and verbs. That's true. But what, what other parts? What is the part of a sentence called? The different parts? The predicate. And predicate is related to the verb. The, so, that's no. The, I know what I'm talking about. All right, watch this. Here's how the English language works, okay? This is really elementary stuff. You've got letters. We combine letters to make what? Yeah. Words. We combine words at a small, at the smallest level, we combine words to make phrases. And a level up from phrases would probably be clauses, and then we combine clauses to make sentences. So we're starting here, but we need to know this stuff. We need to know clauses. Those are really important. And we're going to have to know phrases a little bit too. All right, but I'm kind of starting here and working my way back at time. So clauses are what we use to create these types of sentences. That is correct. So before we start talking about the types of clauses, let's define clause. You already started to help me define clause. Here's your definition. Clause is a group of words with a subject and a verb. That is a clause. A group of words with a subject and a verb. Which first name? Kiera. Kiera, you said there were different types of clauses. You've already identified them. Give me one type of clause. Independent. Independent clause. All right, watch this. An independent clause is a clause. So guess what part, what definition I need to use in the definition? I've got to use the original definition up here. It's an independent clause, so it is a group of words with a subject and a verb. And instead of writing it over, I'm just going to use the quotation marks there. All right, so everything from the first one still applies. But what differentiates an independent clause from a different kind of clause? It stands, independent clause can stand on its own. Stands on its own. Good. Anything else? Okay, so it's a group of words with a subject and a verb that can stand alone. And I'm also going to say it expresses a complete thought. Kara, what's my other type of clause? Dependent. Dependent. This is still a clause, so I'm still going to use my first definition of clause. I'm just going to represent that with the quotation marks here. So if an independent clause can stand alone, guess what? The dependent clause can. cannot stand alone. It does not express a complete thought. Or how about this? Expresses an incomplete thought. So far, so good. I'm going to represent independent clause with the abbreviation IC. I'm going to represent dependent clause with the abbreviation DC. You have to get familiar with these abbreviations. So back to my sentence types. <coughs> simple sentence is comprised of what type or types of clauses? 
It's simple, that's your hint. Yep. Simple sentence equals one I C. One independent clause. Let me give you an example. Here's your example for an independent clause. Cat has diabetes. What's my subject? Cat. Cat. What's my verb? <coughs> has. I've got a group of words. I have a subject. I have a verb. We just identified those. Does that express a complete thought? Yes. Yeah. It does. You don't really need any more information to understand this fact that the cat has diabetes. You might want to know how did the cat get diabetes, but you don't need any more information to understand that the cat has diabetes. So it's a complete thought. Does that make sense? That's your example. So, is this, what I've highlighted on the screen, is that a simple sentence? Yes. Yeah, Raise your hand if you disagree. Cat has diabetes. As you see it on the screen, is that a simple sentence? It's not. Mm -hmm. Tell me why. It's, it is one independent clause, and I told you a simple sentence is one independent clause. I need to add something here. Must be what? There are two things that are keeping what's highlighted on the screen from being, being a simple sentence. It is an independent clause, but it's not a simple sentence yet. Punctuation. That's it. Must be punctuated and capitalized. That's it. But that's a difference, right? I mean, what you see highlighted is not a sentence yet. If I capitalize a T and I add a period, it is. But that is a difference. So that, that is the difference between an independent clause and a simple sentence. Punctuation and capitalization. So here's your example. So far so good? All right, our next type of sentence is compound. What type or types of clauses do I need to create a compound sentence? Two independent clauses. I'm going to say two or more, because technically you could have three or four and it's still a compound sentence. So two or more ICs. Notice I don't use an apostrophe when I write ICs, when I put that S on there. You never, use an, you never use an apostrophe to indicate plural. All right, so just I, C, little s, yes. What about in period, like the point of to be indicated like I, that, C? No, we don't have to do that. We don't have to, not in this case. Sometimes that's helpful, though. All right, so compound sentences, two or more independent clauses. I have to add to that. Joined with. Here are your options. Hang on, hold that thought. The most common way we join two independent clauses is with a comma and coordinating conjunction. I'm, gonna, I'm going to abbreviate coordinate, coordinating conjunction with two little c's. So if you're a note taker, I'm going to move down here, give you a definition of coordinating conjunction. Save yourself some room there. Let me put it at the bottom. Y'all see it? Coordinating conjunction. Coordinating conjunctions. How do you remember your coordinating conjunctions? Fan. Good. Fanboys. F-A-N B-O-Y-S Four and, nor, but, for, yet, and so. 
Those are your fanboys. Those are the only seven. There are only seven coordinating conjunctions. Remember, these are our CC is the abbreviation we're going to use. Going independent clauses. All right, so back to my compound sentences here, back here. A compound sentence is two or more independent clauses joined with a comma and a coordinating conjunction. That's one way to do it. Or, what did we say? Oh, or a semicolon. Or a semicolon plus Transition word plus comma. Those are the three different ways you can make a compound sentence. So, example number one Cat has diabetes. We said that's an independent clause, right? That's our first example. I'm going to use the first way to join independent clauses. I'm going to use a comma and a coordinating conjunction. And the dog has lice. Can I have a please? It's a sad household. Mm -hmm. The cat has diabetes and the dog has fleas. Is this an independent clause, what's highlighted on the screen right here? What's the subject? Dog was the verb. Has the dog has fleas? That's a complete thought. So I've just joined two complete thoughts with a comma and a coordinated conjunction. So far, so good. All right, here's option two. Same two independent clauses, I can use a semicolon. How many of you are confident when using semicolons? One, two, three, four Only people out of the whole class are confident. I don't even remember it, like semicolons is when you're about to list things. Oh, see, you're no longer confident. <laughs> no, make it three people in this class are confident when using semicolons. That's okay, most people aren't, but guess what? Now's the time to figure it out. This is the semester you are going to learn how to, how to use a semicolon. This is the point in your life where you're going to learn how to use this piece of punctuation. All right, you're gonna know how to do it. And if you're not confident, you're gonna learn not to use it. How about that? Mm -hmm. You could get through this entire semester if you want to without using a semicolon in your writing. You, you never have to use it. Because I just showed you, you have another option. You could use a common a coordinated conjunction or what else could you do with this, this sentence here if you didn't want to use a semicolon, if you weren't sure, and you didn't want to use a comma and a coordinating conjunction? What could you do with it? Say it again. Somebody said it. Make it two simple sentences, right? You already know the rule for a simple sentence. It's one independent clause. You know you have two independent clauses. You could have two simple sentences, right? So you don't have to use a semicolon here. Here's the other rule for a, semi a semicolon. It must join two independent clauses and those independent clauses must be related in some way. They must have some kind of relationship or some kind of connection. So for instance, you wouldn't say, the cat has diabetes, I love pizza. You wouldn't join those two independent clauses with a semicolon because there's no relationship between the two. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Unless pizza gave you diabetes or something, but that's a stretch, right? So there has to be some kind of relationship, and I would say in this case, it looks like there's a relationship. All right, next example. Two independent clauses, semicolon plus a transition word. I'm going to use, however, comma. The comma is key. Do not miss the comma. So the cat has diabetes, semicolon, however, the dog has fleas. I'll 
give you a little bit of help down here too. Transition word. Transition words. Indicate a continuation or change thought. So here are some examples. Uh, therefore, uh, whatever, although can be used as a transition word. Furthermore, that's good enough for now. Stick with those. So those are your transition words. Those are some of the transition words. Okay, so that's compound sentence. There are three different ways to create compound sentences. Did I miss anything? I don't think so. So here's a question for you. In this example, the cat has diabetes, however the dog has fleas. Is the word, the word however is my transition word. Is that indicating a continuation of thought or a change of thought? Is that a continuation of the idea that the cat has diabetes or is that a change of thought? Okay. It's a change, okay? So however indicates that change of thought. If I said the cat has diabetes, furthermore, he only has six months to live. That would be a continuation of thought, right? Because I'm still talking about the cat, still talking about this idea that it has diabetes, so it's going to die. Does that make sense? So that's what transition words do. All right, I can move on. My third type of sentence is a complex sentence. How do I create a complex sentence? What parts do I need? Yes, at least one I C and at least one D C. So to do this, I need an incomplete thought somewhere because a D C expresses an incomplete thought. All right, here is a clause. Because my phone is not working, is there a subject? Phone. Is there a verb? Is not working is a whole verb phrase. So working or is is not, that's a verb phrase. So yes, we have a verb. All right, you can say it's is, you can say it's working. I wouldn't be picky about it. Is that a complete thought? No, but it's a group of words with a subject and a verb not a complete thought, so therefore it's a dependent clause, it's a DC. I could add to this this information you see right here. I have to go to the Apple store. Is there a subject? What's the subject? I. What's the verb? Go. Go is part of the verb phrase, so mm -hmm. that would work as a go. You could say have is part of the, any of those words are verbs. Well, two is a preposition, but have and go are verbs. So either one of those would be a verb. So you have a subject, you have a verb. Is that a complete thought? I have to go to the Apple store. Yes, it is. So now what you have is DC comma IC. That's one way you can create a complex sentence. We'll call this an example. Here's the other way you can create a complex sentence.
just changed the order. So now I have IC, DC. Notice what's missing in the second example. The comma is missing in the second example. There should not be a comma in the second example. Many, many people, don't feel bad if you're one of these people, many, many people would put a comma here in the second sentence. And I think I know why. I will put it after Put it after? I don't know why you do that. But I know why people would put it before. Why do you think people might put a comma before the word because here? So they think of this starting here as an independent clause. So then what do they think this is? Not a transition. They think it's a coordinated conjunction. But there's only one B in fanboys, and it doesn't stand for because. Right? It stands for but. So I think some people get that a little bit confused. This is not a coordinated conjunction. This is a special word. It is a, and I'm going to take you back up to your notes here. The dependent clause, you may want to add this information because it's pretty, pretty important. Always starts with Always starts with a subordinated conjunction, like example would be because, when, if, since, those are some examples, or a relative pronoun. got that? So here's what I added. A dependent clause always starts with a subordinating conjunction like the words because, when, if, or since, or a relative pronoun. Always. So if you're trying to figure out if a group of words is dependent or not, look at the first word and you'll be able to tell. Those are not all of the subordinating conjunctions. There are others. There may be like 15 or 20. Those are probably the most common right there though. Wait, so the dependent clause can start a link through? Yes. It can. It wouldn't be a question, that would be a statement. And it, it would probably only fall in the middle or toward the end of the sentence rather than the beginning of the sentence. But don't worry too much about it. You're going to see a lot more of the subordinating conjunctions than the relative pronouns. All right, so we have covered simple sentences, compound sentences, and complex sentences. And the reason we're doing this is because you need to learn sentence patterns. These are directly related to what we just did. This is not really new information. But there are patterns to writing sentences. We'll say pattern number one is I see period. That's a simple sentence. Pattern number two, I see comma CC, I see period. Pattern number three, I see semicolon, I see period. Pattern number four, I see semicolon, transition word, comma, I see. Pattern number five, DC, comma, I see. Pattern number six, I see, comma, nope, I see, DC, no comma. There we go. Those are our six basic sentence patterns. All right, so you need to know these. If you haven't figured these out in your English education lives, this is the time to figure them out. And they're very important. Um, has anybody, anybody ever seen the movie The Matrix? Yeah. At, at a certain point in the movie, the main character is able to see this <coughs> virtual world that he's in as computer code, right? He's in this virtual world and he can see the code, right? Like this document right here that you see on the screen, Someone that writes computer programs knows that the word, the letter S here isn't really an S. It's a series of zeros and ones that they programmed into this machine to create that on the screen, right? There's something behind that. Like it didn't just appear out of nowhere. Somebody had to write computer program code so that if I hit a certain button on the screen, that's the letter that appears, right? Mm -hmm. So there's something behind that one letter there, right? There's something behind that little graphic. Somebody had to 
write some code to make that graphic appear on the screen. When I read your sentences, I see two things. I see your sentences and your ideas, and I see these. These are the codes I see. These are the patterns I see behind your sentences. So I see it in two different ways. Does that make sense? Do you understand the analogy that I'm trying to make? Yeah. You need to start seeing your sentences as these patterns. Because if you don't, you're, you're going to make mistakes. You're not going to get it right. And when there are problems with your sentence patterns, guess what I'm focused on? I'm focused on your punctuation. I'm focused on your patterns. And I'm not focused on your words and your ideas and wherever it went, your persuasion. You can't persuade me if I'm focused on this stuff. I won't be focused on this if it's all right. If you connect your sentences together properly using these, these rules and these six patterns here, you'll be in great shape and I'll be able to process your ideas. But I can't get to your ideas if I'm stuck on the problems you have here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'll be distracted. I don't want to be distracted. So you need to see your sentences the same way I do. You need to see them like this. Now, these are not the only six ways you can create sentences. You can mix and match and combine these in I don't know how many different ways. Maybe a million. All right? You can add to them. You can have a compound sentence followed by a complex idea. So I'll give just to give you an example. And then we'll be done. All right, the cat has diabetes, but the dog is healthy. What sentence pattern do I have? Just give me a number. Three. Pattern number two. All right, watch this. See this here, number six is IC plus DC. You see what I did there? This way, right here, the word because, we know that's a subordinating conjunction. We know that's an incomplete thought. And I just added it to a independent <coughs> clause. right? So I have ICDC here. So what I really have is IC, comma, CC, IC, DC, period. See that? So right here is pattern two. Right here is pattern, what is that, six? But they're sharing, they're sharing the same independent clause, which is OK. I could keep going. I could add more and more to this if I wanted to. At some point, it becomes a subjective run-on sentence, and it becomes too long, too much for the reader to process. But technically, as long as you follow the six patterns and the way that they're punctuated with commas or semicolons, technically, you're not in, in any trouble. Once it gets too long, though, and too many ideas, you want to start breaking it down a little bit. But there are a million different ways to combine these patterns as long as you follow the rules set forth in these six. Does that make sense? If this has not sunk in, you've got a long uphill battle in this class, and you've got some work to do this week to figure it out. Okay? Uh, we'll meet again Thursday, and I think we'll be done. I think we're done discussing these. Uh, notice also this one at the bottom. This would be an example of a compound complex sentence. And if I change the order around, I could have a complex compound sentence. That's what those are. So we're going to have to talk about punctuation on Thursday, and we'll talk more about your assignment, which is the anecdote assignment. If you want to read that stuff before class, that's fine. I don't think you have anything to do before class. If I didn't get you at the beginning of class, make sure you see me so I can get you marked for attendance.